Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Today, we're calling it Museum Artifact Day, where we've got a real cool item to show you. I'm not going to zoom in on it yet. Uh, a one-of-a-kind item in this museum. It's what our museum is all about. And this item is tied into the three pictures I have behind me, which you space geeks out there probably have already figured out. It's Mercury Redstone 1 the November 1960 launch of the first unmanned, uncrewed Mercury capsule uh, at Pad 5 out of Cape Canaveral Air, Air Force Station at the time in 1960. Uh, this flight happened on November 21st, and we've got a, we've got a piece in our museum that, that caused this problem that uh, we're going to outline here in just a second. Uh, but we wanted to just talk about the fact that what you're seeing behind me here is what our museum is all about. We celebrate the birth of the American Space Age. And here, six decades ago, in 1961, we had this Atlas rocket being fueled up over here to my right. Uh, and I'll show you a better picture of that here in a second. Uh, well, let me just bring that up there. There's Chris. There's the Atlas rocket being fueled. Move that there. Thank you, Jessica. And um, uh, there you see the people at the bottom. Look at that. The, the rocket engineers at the bottom, shirt sleeves, slacks, a hard hat. No worries. We got 300 degree below zero liquid oxygen there that were fueling this uh, Redstone rocket at the time. In 1960, one of the most complicated vehicles built in the world. All right. This is high tech stuff, though it pales in comparison to what we're walking around with with our smart tablets and how automated our cars are these days. But what we love talking about our American Space Museum and why we love your support of our nonprofit is the people that were here at this event, a very historic event, and I'll explain it to you in a minute, were people like Ike Rigel, who was one of the in the launch control. Ike is now 97 years old, maybe 98. Hi, Ike. Uh, Lee Solid. Uh, a, a, a general a rocket dyne engineer working on the rockets, uh, been a supporter of our museum and on our board. Lee Solid, Jack Martin, and Murphy Wardman are both here Thursdays. They'll be here tomorrow. Can't wait to see them sitting there at the docent desk. They're both pushing 90 years old and got all kinds of uh, crazy stories to tell about living in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the early birth of the space age. Uh, behind the Engineering here today is Jessica Galloway. Thank you, Jessica. She's writing something on our board there to remind me. Uh, we'll take a picture of the guys tomorrow. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll get a picture of, of Jack Martin and Murphy Wardman here. Well, I also wanted to mention at the beginning, uh, we thank uh, our audience on YouTube and uh, Twitch. I got a Twitch there, Je Jessica. I got, a, I got a Twitch, so we must have got a new uh, viewer on Twitch, so... And, of course, our, our loyal Facebook fans from all over the world. Jessica, we heard from India yesterday. I didn't write down your name, but we're listening to India. Uh, of course, we've got uh, Ophelia. Hello to you in Normandy, France. we got the UCAC brothers, Tom and Mark in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, maybe Sylvia Monaco's watching from down the road in uh, uh, Melbourne, Florida. Um, and I uh, wanted to give a shout-out to Dave Stang in Macomb, Michigan. Uh, we all appreciate how you all have embraced this program and we're trying our best every day to make it a little better program. And as you can see, we're gonna kind of create some days of the week. Monday, we wanna be stargazer mark about what you can see from your backyard in astronomy. And uh, this Wednesday or Thursday, we'll make them uh, uh, museum artifact days because you're gonna enjoy the artifact I have to share with you here in a minute. So. Uh, Enough of the public relations there, but we do love everybody out there supporting our program. We wouldn't be doing it here today, a year and a half after we started it in March 2019, born out of the pandemic. We wouldn't be here doing this today uh, with uh, new improved equipment without your support and love of this. And we've got a new computer that we're so grateful to the Marie's Louise G. West Endowment Fund that has enabled us to buy a new uh, state-of-the-art computer that uh, is going to solve a lot of our problems, particularly streaming to three different uh, uh, platforms. platforms. That's, that's what you call it, three platforms. Incredible. 
Uh, Marty Winkle, my co-producer, cameraman, and friend's not here today. He's going to nurse his vacation till the end of the month, so end of the week, I mean. So he'll be back uh, next uh, week. And I need him because he really straightens me out a lot on this show when I misspeak in, in ways. So uh, we all need that. And, of course, uh, we'll hear more about Jessica at the end of the program when we brag about her. But uh, we're so grateful to uh, the West Endowment for uh, allowing us to buy some equipment. That uh, And we need to take a picture behind the scenes here because I got umbrella lights around me. It's become a real studio set from when Marty and I started doing it uh, back in March tw uh uh, 2020. So let's get on with the show today and what this is all about. What I have directly over, over my head is fueling up the Mercury Redstone rocket. Okay, and this is historically called the uh, four inch flight. All right, and what happened was it was nine o'clock in the morning, launch complex five. This Redstone rocket was to do a suborbital flight. Uh, go up about 100 miles and 150 miles down range. And uh, then uh, its uh, launch tower was, of course, coming off uh, when that was safe to do. And uh, that launch tower, the red thing at the top, was to whisk the astronaut away if there was problem with the rocket booster. And um, then they had a whole flotilla of, of aircraft and helicopters out there. Uh, to uh, pick up the capsule after it turned around and went through the reentry of the Earth's atmosphere. All this was planned to do for the very first time, and the launch control director was none other than Christopher Kraft, uh, the uh, Chris Kraft, the legendary uh, NASA flight control man that he invented the, the job of flight of launch control. And uh, we'll hear about what he said about this launch because. They used Mercury spacecraft number two out of the McDonald uh, uh, production facility in St. Louis and Redstone uh, Mercury rocket number one. In uh, the first attempt, November 7th, they had last minute problems with the capsule. So th two weeks later, uh, uh, almost th over three weeks later, they are going to launch this on the 21st of November. In a normal countdown, at 9 o'clock, the Mercury Redstone's engine ignited on schedule. Now, i got to do a segue in there. For all you like Jessica that might not understand, these were going to have ballistic weapons on them. And though this one might not have carried a nuclear weapon, it was building up to the Atlas rocket to carry nuclear arsenals to protect us from the Soviet Union's threat. So this is the big Cold War, middle of it. And uh, so at 9 o'clock, the engines fired up and shut down immediately. Uh, after liftoff from the launch pad, the rocket rose 4 inches, 10 centimeters, before settling back into the pad. All right, alarms were immediately sounded at launch pad 5. And that's what's going on to the far, the farthest picture over there, okay, to my left. Uh, I guess that'd be your right. Yep, there, there, there it is, uh, right the instant of launch. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, right the instant of launch. You see the flame coming out, and then it stopped. And then what, it, then what happened was the escape tower fired off, okay? And then uh, once the escape tower fired off, it went up 4,000 feet and then came back down and landed about 400 feet from the pad. When the escape tower went off, the uh, drogue chute popped out, and then the regular parachute came out. Because what happened, and I'll explain to you what happened, uh, was that the spacecraft thought it was uh, free of the rocket and free of its, of its uh, escape tower. And so, and it was in the atmosphere, at a, at a, so that the barometric pressure is what controlled the uh, 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 parachutes from coming out. So it thought it was to pop out his parachute. The space capsule did what it's supposed to do, and we don't have the video for you. But if you go and watch the video, it's you're in the comments. It's in the comments. She's got the comments, the URL for the video there. We were going to try and bring it to you, but the computer we're using is just too taxed with our our three pro platforms that we're broadcasting to: Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And um, uh, so we'll soon be able to bring you some videos, but it's a cool little 17-minute second video. I found uh, a, a full documentary on it. 
Okay, and Jessica found a documentary on it, so uh, uh, hopefully I'm not embarrassed by what I'm going to tell them here, Jessica, that I say it right. But I am reading from the official NASA report on this. Um, so quite an quite a embarrassment. Uh, everybody is mobilized for a 15-second launch to the edge of outer space and back for the first time with an uncrewed Mercury that we eventually put Alan Shepard on this. And that Alan Shepard's flight was May... Uh, May 7th, I think, in 1962, followed by uh, the uh, suborbital flight of, of Gus Grissom. And then the Redstone rocket was not used for crewed flights anymore. They went to the Atlas rocket. So um, that is a big day in, in, in space history that turned into an incredible flop. A lot of wonderful things, amazing things about this. It could have gone completely wrong. The rocket could have tipped over and blown up. The, with the, the main and the reserve parachutes hanging, dangling off the side, the wind they were worried was going to blow it and topple it over. So there was panic in the, the control room. And the launch team was just, they didn't know what to do. Okay, what do we do? We never, we don't have a scenario where the rocket starts for a few seconds and then doesn't go up. And the, so they considered taking a rifle and shooting holes in the side of it to uh, outgas the, the fuel. Uh, as if a, the spark of a rocket would, of a rifle wouldn't have blown it up. Flight director Chris Kraft rejected several unsafe interventions, including using a rifle to shoot holes in the booster's propellant tanks to depressurize them. Kraft eventually took the advice of one of the test engineers to simply wait out the battery discharge and let the oxidizer boil off. This early test failure and panic led Chris Kraft to make his first rule of flight control. This is the first rule of flight control, Chris Kraft said. If you don't know what to do, don't do anything. And that was permeated right down to the tragedies we had with the, well, the, the near tragedy with Apollo 13 and the, the uh, shuttles. The immediate thing is keep your calm, grab your data. We can't do anything about it right now. Uh, so uh, Chris Kraft, quite quite a guy. Uh, he lived to be in his 90s. Now, what happened was, and I'll have Jessica zoom in, of this plaque that we have here. There were two cables that were attached to the bottom edge of one of the tail fins that would separate at liftoff. And what I have here is one of them. And this is a plaque given, and I'll read the plaque real quickly here. There, you can see that right there as I tilt it. You can read it for yourself. Thank you, Jessica. To Kurt, uh, Kurt, to Kurt, Dr. Kurt H. Debus, who was the 10-year director of the, and the first director of Kennedy Space Center, quote, the missing link commemorating the two and a half inch flight of MR1 from launch operations, okay? They didn't put the date on there. That's kind of weird. But what you're looking at here is the electrical connection that was the power cable that was attached to this tail fin. The other one was a cable, uh, was, a, was a control cable uh, that uh, provided signals for the controls. Both cables were unplugged at the rocket at the bottom. They were plugged in at the bottom one of the tail fins and was separated at liftoff. The control cable was supposed to separate first, powered by what we think is the power cable here. However, for this launch, the control cable was longer than expected. It was designed for a different Redstone rocket, the military one, rather than the shorter cable designed for the Mercury Redstone. Uh, so they clamped it. They, they took the greater length and clamped it up there, but the, but the clamp didn't work. And when the vehicle lifted off, the clamping came apart and uh, the control cable separation was de delayed get this, delayed by only 29 milliseconds after the power cable had separated. 29 milliseconds. This is technical stuff in 1960, 61 years ago, okay? Thank you, Jessica. Uh, now this is what our museum is all about. This is a one-of-a-kind relic. It is off of that Mercury Redstone 1 61 years ago. Uh, not the part that failed, the part that did the right thing. And, and 29 milliseconds after the power cable had separated, then the control cable did. And it's supposed to be the other way around. And what that did was tell the rocket, we're done. Everything's okay. The, the, uh, and so it set itself down after a uh, 10 centimeter. They say two and a half inches here 
which they may have thought at the time was all it went up. And then maybe data later showed that it went up four and a half uh, or four inches before settling back down the pad. Oh, the four inch flight. Yep, the four oh, inch flight. Later. And uh, so, so they just, how long, when Chris Kraft said, let's just let the battery die and then, then it'll outgas itself when the battery's not in there to keep the propellant cool. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, that's what they did. And it took till the next morning for the Redstone's liquid oxygen to boil off so they could work on the rocket and render it safe. So no doubt there are people out there babysitting it all night hoping winds didn't blow in and knock it over because <clears throat> it would have blown up. Now, in the aftermath of this, of course, they redid the wiring, and that's always why they have uncrewed flights and test flights, is to uh, provide many things. Uh, in my research of the, this, I discovered that there was um, uh, something like, um, uh, oh, you got my notes there, Jessica, uh, six miles of wiring, I think, there. Uh, thank you there. I gave her the URL for there. Uh, seven miles of wiring. Uh, they had a special electronic brain, uh, which was a compartment of wires that, that uh, went to different things. Of course, the Redstone rocket was built in the uh, Man uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, that was the brainchild of Werner von Braun, uh, who on this date in history, in 1958, three years before this event, von Braun had started his Saturn uh, Saturn 1 and Saturn 5 design studies were authorized to build a one and a half million pound uh, rocket. And uh, also on this date in 1956, Vandenberg was chosen by the U.S. Air Force as its place for main operations. And, uh, and uh, 60, uh, five years later, Vandenberg is one of the most important uh, pieces of real estate in America to protect our country. And Jessica lived outside of Vandenberg for a period of time. In Vandenberg? Uh, we were stationed there. Oh, you were stationed there. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, your dad was in the Air Force or a contractor? Oh, your husband was. Okay, that's right. That's right. Troy, her husband, Troy Gallagher. Hey, Troy, we know you're watching. By the way, Troy's given us a lot of stars, and those stars are just a, a one cent each, all right? So 100 stars is like sending us a dollar. But we get the dollar, okay? We get it from Facebook, believe you me. So, um, so yeah, Troy, and we're going to have Troy on the program one day to talk about the top secret stuff that he can tell us about on there. So they did redo this launch in, uh, uh, it was November, and then they redid the launch, uh, MR2, uh, or MR1A, they called it, was uh, about a month later, December 19th. So it, did, it didn't take them long to figure out what went wrong. And that was a very successful launch. Everything went the way it was supposed to. Uh, on this launch uh, that was in November 1960, and we just love sharing what is in our museum, like this space, like this, this uh, control cable, electrical. Uh, that was the electrical part that definitely was involved with messing up the um, MR1 flight. So now you know, and we have all kinds of this stuff in our museum. Can't wait for you to come to our museum and see this stuff personally. But we're going to bring you an artifact from the museum every uh, day, every, every week. So uh, uh, we've been wanting to do that for a while. Uh, I don't have white gloves on here because this is a wood plaque. But uh, we're careful with our stuff. Don't want it handled a whole lot. And uh, But we're uh, talking to our collection manager, Nick Enix, who's just done a wonderful job making this museum look uh, like the Smithsonian. We I was at the Smithsonian six weeks ago, and their, their displays looked Look, ours looked every bit as, as quality as theirs do. So, and those of you that have been here know that. And uh, so we wanted to uh, thank you all for participating in a little bit of space history there. Jessica's playing around with our final piece of the puzzle uh, that we've got to had six or seven different elements to bring together for this new computer we're getting. So we got some high hopes that we can do some really fun stuff for you on Stay Curious. So... Let's have a birthday. We've got a birthday today. And there's, oh, by the way, there is the MR1 capsule. Uh, where's that at? That is at um, the Mercury capsule number two, which was used for both the Red, Mercury Redstone 1 and the 1A missions, which did go suborbital. 
or is on display at the NASA Ames Exploration Center, Moffett Federal Airfield near Mountain View, California. And Robert Law, have you been there? <laughs> we tease Robert Law because he is an avid space aficionado and has been to America many times. Wouldn't surprise me if, Mar if uh, uh, Robert, who is in uh, Scotland, uh, if he is, isn't posting a picture right now to prove that he's seen seen this very picture Drop there. It in the comments, Robert. That's right. So, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna acknowledge everybody who's watching. Stay curious here. We're trying to work that up on a, a, a thing to throw up there. It'll be a lot of fun. So, but we do have an astronaut birthday today, and a happy big six zero to Chris Ferguson. Fergie's his nickname. Chris Ferguson was born on September first, nineteen sixty one, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. So I'm sure they're proud of their heritage of having a first-class astronaut. He was the pilot of uh, Atlantis on STS-115 in 2006. And then he commanded two space shuttle missions, kind of back-to-back, STS-126. In in, and then in 2011, he was the commander of the last space shuttle mission, of course, uh, um, uh, Atlantis. Uh, in uh, July 2011, uh, Chris is well known on the Space Coast here. He, he's attended a lot of things. And he was also going to be the commander of the Boeing Starliner, CST-100 Starliner. But he stepped down a year ago, about a year ago this time, uh, citing personal reasons. So uh, we respect those, of course. But uh, one heck of a guy, a great astronaut. Uh, and, you know, I've always respect he's one time pilot and then a commander. Usually you're a pilot twice and then a commander. And we've got an interview a week from today with Andy Allen, who is also a one time pilot and twice a commander. And I can't wait to ask uh, astronaut Allen about uh, does that take a lot of smarts or uh, were you just the guy uh, available or in the queue or what? what? What's up with that? So. We're hoping to have a great conversation with uh, Andy Allen, who I've actually had a steak dinner with uh, a while back. Uh, don't know if he'll remember my curious mind uh, over that dinner, but uh, we'll uh, we'll ask him about it for sure. So, uh, Jessica, thank you for all you do. Again, we miss uh, Marty being behind the scenes here. Uh, and, uh, of course, we also miss uh, Travis Thompson, Triple T. Talked with Triple T. Uh, last night he wants to come back this Friday and do his show but we'll we'll just see how well he is of course he doesn't he did not have COVID he had some other uh, medical uh, uh, situation going on uh, but uh, we are very conscious here in our museum about the uh, getting anybody infected particularly the children so uh, your logo here if uh, you uh, sponsor us in any way shape or form and we'll hopefully slap one of those up there tomorrow uh, with some people that have been sending us some checks, and we appreciate that uh, a lot. And uh, Jessica Galloway is this young lady here in her Star Trek uh, science officers, right? Yeah. Science officer garb there. Okay, and she will hatch your dreams into reality. My executive director, Karen Conklin, and I were just uh, having our morning meeting this morning, and uh, I was telling her two years ago, I can't wait for some whiz kid like Jessica to come in here that knows about social media to help you all stay curious and take this museum to the next level. And thank you, Jessica, because you're doing that and it's much appreciated. And uh, the board of directors will know about it, too, So, because that's where we can get her a little bit of uh, walk around money. So uh, we've got over $10,000 this year have too many bushel baskets full of hundred dollar bills to keep our eyes open because we feel like we're doing amazing things to help you stay curious okay and uh, those a lot of those things involve our youth our director karen conklin's all about our steam education programs science technology engineering arts and math and uh, we think the world of our brevard county youth in particularly who have the unique heritage of being the only place in the world where humans have gone to the moon in one of three places where we've launched humans in orbit. That's the heritage of growing up here in Brevard County, and I'm so blessed to help represent the museum in that way. So until tomorrow when we bring you another updated news program and some interesting facts, 
To help you stay curious, I'm Mark Marquette, and we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.